Amen. You can be seated. Go with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 20 as we can continue Paul's message to the elders of Ephesus. By way of introduction, I think we can learn a lesson from December 7th, 1941, as Japanese forces approached the U.S. naval base at Pearl Harbor. Their aim was to destroy the U.S. Pacific Fleet in one attack, rendering the U.S. incapable of stopping their advance. Their only hope of achieving this mission was to pull off a complete surprise attack. The Americans did not know they were coming, and they missed multiple warnings. As I studied that this week, I was surprised. Japanese scout planes were spotted, but ignored. Japanese subs were spotted. They even fired on one of them, but no alarm was raised. And the first wave of 180 planes were spotted on radar, but it was assumed that this was a group of U.S. planes returning from training. As a result of these ignored warning signs, though the U.S. had thousands of men who could have been at their stations, most of them were asleep in their bunks. And though the U.S. had anti-aircraft guns that could have been firing, their ammo was locked away in storage. And though the U.S. had hundreds of planes they could have launched to fight off the Japanese bombers, only six of them managed to get in the air that day. Japanese damaged or destroyed 19 ships, 340 aircraft, and killed or wounded 3,500 men. How did this happen? I believe most centrally this occurred because Walter Short, the commander of the Army Forces in Hawaii, the man responsible for the defense of the base, ignored the warnings and orders he received from Washington. They said, war is coming, and he said, nah, I don't think so. Defenses were not ready. Intelligence wasn't unified. No one was prepared to guard the fleet. If Short had understood the danger and listened to his commanders, each of those early warning signs and many others would have been heeded and they would have been able to defend. It would not have been nearly the disaster that it was. What happened in Pearl Harbor was a tragedy, but the same tragedy, a similar tragedy happens weekly in churches around the world who are led by elders like Lieutenant General Short. Elders who have been commanded to guard the flock but have become lazy or they've ignored the warning. They have not seen their role in guarding the sheep. So as we look at Paul's words in uh, in Acts 20 to the Ephesian elders, we're going to see that call for elders to guard the flock and how that impacts every one of our lives. Let's pray and ask the Lord to help us understand and submit to this truth. Father, we are thankful to have your word to study. We are thankful that it is more authoritative than a command from Washington, that it is trustworthy, that we have no reason to doubt it, we have no need to doubt it. I pray, God, humble us, help us submit to it, help us see the truth. God, I pray especially this morning that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight. We are distracted by many things today. But our Lord, our rock, and our Redeemer stands apart from all things, over all things, in sovereign control of all things. Help us look to you as our hope this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll begin by reading verses 17 through 38. We'll read the entire address that Paul makes to the elders. That way we have our context in mind. Begin in verse 17. Now from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus, Paul sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them, you yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public from house to house testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I am going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that through the Holy Spirit, or except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course 
and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Pay careful attention to yourselves, to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to care for the church of God which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish every one of you with tears. And I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me. In all things, I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful most of all because of the word he had spoken. They would not see his face again. And they accompanied him to the ship. In this middle section, verses 25 to 31, Paul speaks to the shepherd's role of guarding the flock. And the first way shepherds guard the flock is by continually pointing to Christ. Let's reread verses 25 to 27. And now behold, I know that none of you among whom I've gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore I testify to you this day that I'm innocent of the blood of all, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Paul pointed to Christ in his method. He's innocent of the blood of all. Like Jeremiah before him, he had been a faithful watchman on the wall, warning the people in Ephesus of the approach of the enemy. And he did this primarily in the method of his ministry, which was first and foremost preaching and teaching. Look at the verbs that Paul uses throughout this address. In verse 20, he declared to them. He taught them publicly and privately. In verse 21 and 24, he testified to them. In 25, he proclaimed to them. In 27, he didn't shrink back from declaring to them. There was no word which God gave him as a watchman that Paul had not proclaimed to the church. Paul was continually sounding the warning from the wall. He was faithful in his method to speak. But what did he speak about? Well, he pointed to Christ in his message. Paul says in verse 20, he declared anything that was profitable. And we saw last week the most profitable thing is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That we must repent of our wickedness and our sin and give up our attempts to save ourselves. That we must turn to the holy and righteous God as our greatest treasure and only Savior. That we must put on faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and in his work as the God-man who lived to earn our righteousness and died to pay our sin debt and rose to give us everlasting life and ascended to reign from on high to protect us as we follow him in obedience. Paul continually pointed to Christ in his message. He spoke, just look at the way he summarizes. He spoke of Christ's grace and the gospel of God. He spoke of Christ's kingdom and the hope we have for everlasting life. He spoke of the whole counsel of God, which he summarized as pointing to Christ. Friends, this is very important for guarding the flock because Paul is making it clear that he left nothing out. He is innocent of the blood of all because he did not shrink away from declaring anything that they needed to know. So, so friends, if you're here today and you're wondering what Christianity is all about, if you're trying to find the secret thing that you need to know, there are no secret things to know. There's just the gospel, and it can save your soul. If you need to know that today, to believe that, to repent, to come and talk with me or someone else here. But for those of us who are Christians, how does declaring the whole counsel of God guard the church? Alexander Strzok, in his book on this chapter, says it well. He said, such thorough teaching of the whole of God's counsel would help deter false teachers from later alleging that only they possess the secret teachings of Paul. Because there are no secret teachings of Paul. 
if Paul preached the whole counsel of God and we believe that the whole counsel of God has been recorded for us in the scriptures, which we do, then there is nothing a false teacher can offer us. There's nothing we're lacking. There's nothing that we need. Think about every weight loss pill that's ever been advertised. What are they? This is the thing. This is the secret. This is what you're missing. Every time it's this extra super thing beyond what we have already. That's also every false teacher. We have the whole counsel of God. We don't need anything else. Paul pointed to Christ in his message as the whole thing and in his willingness to leave, we see him pointing to Christ as the true Messiah. Look back to verse 25. He says, you will never see my face again. He's going to face affliction and imprisonment. And look, if anyone, like if we're thinking strategically about the church, Paul being in prison is a terrible plan from a human level, right? I mean, if we need to keep anyone out of prison, it's Paul, because he's the one going out pre planning all these churches. But Paul's not worried. He's not worried about the Ephesian church. He's not worried about any church, because while he knows persecution will come, and he knows even wolves will come in among them, he's not afraid, because he was never the one keeping the church safe in the first place. He isn't the Messiah. He's not the good shepherd, and he's walking away with confidence and in doing so, he points to the one who is their confidence. And friends, I'm going to be really honest with you. I, I could have taught this three weeks ago, but I don't know that I would have believed it at least the same way three weeks ago. I've got something wrong with my stomach. We're, we're trying to figure out what it is. But, but for a time, I was worried it was something really serious. And the, the thought that plagued my mind was if something happens to me, what will happen to our church? Which shows that I thought of myself as your Messiah. God used a verse to help break my pride in this area, or at least to begin to. Psalm 103, 14, God knows our frame. He remembers we are dust. God is far too wise and far too loving to make his beloved church dependent on dust such as I. One pastor said it this way, God has already appointed his Messiah, and he did not appoint you. Friends, if the, if the church in Ephesus did not need Paul, then the church here does not need me. It doesn't need any of us. It needs Christ. By walking away, Paul was pointing to Christ. Friends, the elders are called to guard the sheep by pointing to Christ in every area, and this is something I need you to hold me accountable to. I'm very prideful. I need you to help me remember that I'm not the Messiah. In practical ways, encourage me to take breaks. Demonstrate practically. Remind me that I need to demonstrate practically. I know that not everything relies on me. I'll say that out loud, but I don't act like it sometimes. Tell me how you're growing through other people's ministry and then watch my heart and my face and see if I'm excited about that or jealous of that. Oh, my heart is wicked. All this wonderful stuff that's going on in Sarah's Bible study and part of my heart is like, well, good for her because I, I want to be the one leading the Bible study with all the good fruit because I'm prideful. Rejoice in what God is doing, especially when it has nothing to do with me, and tell me so I can be reminded of the true Messiah. Secondly, we can seek to appoint other elders who live this way. I'm thankful for men in our church who bless us by sharing wisdom and experience or their teaching, their knowledge, just even their preferences and their opinions. They're often helpful to hear. I'm thankful for those things. But that's not what we need in our elders. We need elders who talk about Jesus, who point to Christ. So look for men who, when they speak, speak first and most of the Messiah in their message. And third, we can apply this to our own personal lives. The central method of the elder is to teach and proclaim the whole counsel of God, but that is true of all of us as well. That is our central role as parents, not to produce moral, happy, successful children, but to produce children that know the Word of God and the gospel. We say we believe that, but practically, what do we spend the majority of our time teaching our kids? Do we spend the majority of our time helping them have fun? 
And I'm not saying never have fun with your kids. Just get them home from school and make them read the Bible until they pass out. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying, what is our focus? This is also the same in our witness at work in school. We say we believe faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes from the Word of God, but how often do we simply try and love people without actually sharing what the Word says? Elders are not the only ones whose lives should be defined by a central and primary message and method of Christ. And also, just briefly, none of us are the Messiah, only Jesus is. So if you think you can save your kids by homeschooling and building the perfect home or sending them to public school and the best education or whatever you think you can do to save your kids or to save your friend or to save your family, you're not the Messiah. We're not the Messiah. We point to Christ. That's our hope. Elders guard the sheep. It is their main responsibility to guard the sheep by pointing to the good shepherd who guards us perfectly. But shepherds not only speak, they also provide care to the flock. Look at verse 28, one of the most dense verses in the Bible, in my opinion. Paul says, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. Shepherds must provide care for the sheep, but this begins with self-examination. Who does Paul say to take care of first, to pay careful attention to first? Your own selves, your own hearts. Because a shepherd's heart is just as deceitful and desperately wicked as every other heart, every other sheep's heart. Notice they're not drawn out of the sheep. It says, in which the Holy Spirit made you overseers. We're not out of, we're not separate from, we are in. Elders are the same. They're just given a different role. They're not holier or more like Jesus. They're given a different role. This is why Paul proclaimed the kingdom, declared the whole counsel of God, did not shrink back from confronting even the elders themselves. Because they need to hear the word of God. They need to repent and believe. They need to treasure Christ above all, just like any other member of the church. Elders are just as sinful. And secondly, elders are chief targets of the enemy. Richard Baxter wrote to pastors, take heed to yourselves because the tempter will make his first and sharpest attack on you. He knows what devastation he is likely to make among the rest if he can make the leader fall before their eyes. Elders are under attack, and they are distinctly tempted to pride. Baxter compared the proud preacher to Samson, the judge of Israel. He said, do not allow Satan to use you as the Philistines use Samson. First to deprive you of your strength, then to put out your eyes, and finally to make you subject of his triumph and derision. When pastors fall into pride like Samson did, they fail, or they fall not only destroying themselves, but often the families around them, the church around them. Pastors must care for the church with self-examination. Think about the instructions that none of us pay attention to on the airplane. In the event of a loss of pressurization, whose mask do you put on first? Your own. Why? Don't you love your child more? Don't you want to care for it? Yes, but if you don't put on your own mask, no one will be there to help your child. But friends, I wonder if that's any of us. We're so consumed with helping others that we neglect our own souls. We're about to pass out because we've not been breathing the life-giving oxygen of the Word of God. We're too busy trying to shove the mask onto other people's faces. Parents, do we spend time in the Word ourselves or do we neglect it because we need to teach our children? Friends, do you spend your time studying and trying to answer all the unbelieving questions that you get without actually studying to just know God yourself? It's good to do those things. It's good to pray for others, but do we pray for ourselves that we would grow in holiness, that we would become more like Christ? All of us must begin with self-examination. This is not the world's teaching of love yourself most. This is the Word's teaching of know you yourself are the worst sinner. (laughs) and that you yourself need Christ before you can help anyone else. Elders must pay careful uh, careful attention to their own hearts and to all the flock without separation. It's all the flock. It's not some of the flock. This is a very easy temptation shepherds fall into because it's way more fun to care for friendly sheep than the ones that bite you. 
to guide the sheep towards pasture and just leave the stubborn ones where they sit, to feed the sheep that joyfully listen and ignore the ones who refuse guidance. Friends, that's not the job of the shepherd. The shepherd is called to provide care for all the flock. Think of Jesus. He left the 99 to search for the one that had wandered off. And we always think of Jesus in that moment as this wonderful and gracious shepherd. But if, if we had to go find some sheep that had wandered off for the 86th time, it's not a cute moment for us. We'd be frustrated. Now, Jesus is never frustrated with us. Don't get me wrong. Jesus cares for the flock, even the one who continually wanders off. We must love the church. Do we love the church? But when we say that, we really mean the three people we like and we kind of ignore the rest. Or do we love the church, all the church, all the church? Shepherds care for the church without separation and with submission, for the Spirit has made them overseers. I learned this week that when the president is elected, he is responsible to appoint <clears throat> 4,000 jobs which is a lot of jobs. And that means that 4,000 people, their job is entirely dependent on whether the president is happy with the job they're doing. Doesn't matter what Congress thinks, doesn't matter if the job's being done, it's just if the president likes them and likes what they're doing. This is why it's so important, this line is so important, because an elder does not make himself an elder, and even the church does not make someone an elder. Now certainly... Southern View voted for me to be the elder of this church. Lord willing, at some point, we will vote to appoint another elder. But we won't be making someone an elder. That's the Spirit's work. Just like when we bring someone into membership, we're not making them a Christian. We're recognizing what God has already done. This is different from any other job. The role of an elder must be something you're already doing before you begin. We're not going to stand around and vote for someone who's like, okay, well, Billy's an elder now, so you better start shepherding our people. That would be foolishness. Instead, we'll stand around and we'll say, look at how Billy loves the church and cares for the church and pours himself out for the church. Look at how he already meets the qualifications in the scriptures. Look at how he loves the flock. We recognize that the Spirit has already made him an overseer, an elder, a shepherd, and we make that official. This is so important to the leadership of the church because if you all made me an elder, then who am I most responsible to? You. You. Who am I going to serve? You. But if the Holy Spirit made me an overseer, I am freed to lead because, uh, let's say, my desires are different than what the Spirit has revealed through the Word. It doesn't matter what I want. I have to submit to the Spirit. The Spirit's the one who gave me the job. Or what if all the church says we're going this way and the Scriptures say we go this way? doesn't matter what the church says. We do what the Spirit has said through the Word because the Spirit's the one who makes elders. And this concept of leading and guarding ties into our next point. The Spirit has made them overseers, and so they must provide care with supervision. This term overseer refers to the same role of elder and pastor and shepherd. They're all the same role, and overseers are guardians, those responsible for keeping others safe. It's rooted in the idea of looking at and examining something, inspecting something with the purpose of action. Joe Rigney defined it this way, oversight is more than merely sight. Oversight is sight plus responsibility. To exercise oversight means that when you see, you are responsible to do something about it. You can't just see, you must also see to it. A parent is not a parent because they see their children doing something. A parent acts like a parent when they see their children doing something, they go and help them or they stop them depending on what the child is doing. Paul is reminding these elders that they are not merely to stand there passively proclaiming the word, though that's central. They're to oversee the sheep. They're to be on watch. They're to be responsible for them. This is why the author of Hebrews commands us to obey and submit to our elders, for they are keeping watch over our souls as those who will give an account. The elders keep watch over your souls. That's the reason we should obey them. A child should listen to their parent, not just because they're their parent, but because they trust their parent cares for their soul and their body. Why should the child get out of the road when the mother says? Because they trust the mother knows what's best. It's not that the mother's keeping them from joy and happiness. It's that they're keeping them safe. We must obey our elders even when we don't understand. And this idea may be horrifying to you. Does God really want you to obey some man 
who can command you to do whatever, whatever he wants? Of course not. For he calls shepherds to oversee for the purpose of providing shepherding care. The word to care here is actually the verb form of shepherd. He's calling them to shepherd, to feed, to care for, to help the sheep. How do shepherds care for sheep? Well, I learned this week it's different than cows. If you remember the cowboy movies your grandpa made you watch every time you were over there, where were the cowboys in relation to the cows? They're always behind them with whips and lassos and guns, scaring them and pushing them forward to wherever the cowboys want them to go. That's not how sheep work. Sheep follow. As Jesus said in John 10, they follow their own shepherd whose voice they know and trust to lead them in good pasture and to water and to life. You can't lead sheep from behind with yells and whips. You walk before them as an example and caring leader. You cautiously and graciously approach those who wander off. You bandage the wounded and treat the sick and carry the weak. This is the balance of Scripture. Paul knows that when humans are given authority, they are immediately tempted to abuse that authority. He knows that. Paul's elders to a better way of leadership, the way of Christ the Good Shepherd, to go before them as their example, to have compassion that moves us to care for their needs. And friends, this is a really clear and practical application. Do we obey our elders? Do we submit to our shepherds? And do we do with the right attitude? Hebrews 13 says, let them elder you, let them shepherd you, let them lead you with joy and not with groaning, for that would be no advantage to you. Do you want a life of advantage? Do you want a life of blessing? God's plan for you to reach that blessed pasture land and still water is to obey and submit to your pastors that lead you with care. And yes, I feel weird saying that as your pastor. But if I'm going to teach the whole counsel of God, that includes this verse and this concept. Obviously, this doesn't mean I get to tell you all what to do in every situation. You just have to listen. That's, that's not any of the example of Scripture. It's not how shepherds work. Shepherds aren't giving overly specific commands to every sheep about every step to take. They're out front. They're leading by example. They're going in a specific direction. But friends, consider, is there an area of your life you've been walking in a different direction than how your shepherd has been leading you? Whatever the world says, if your shepherd has spoken in submission to the Spirit and the Word and spoken to you with shepherding care and you go another way, you will not find blessing there. Not because I am great, but because the word is great and the good shepherd is greater. Shepherds face a high and difficult calling to provide care for the sheep in all these ways can feel overwhelming. Paul knows this, and so he reminds them of his motivation and our heart and hope for obeying our shepherds is that our shepherds would serve with a servant's heart. <clears throat> Paul invokes the name of the triune God to remind the elders whose sheep they are caring for. This is the church of God, the Father. The sheep belong to him, they were chosen by him, and he has promised to sustain them. This is the church which God the Son obtained with his own blood. Jesus has shown how greatly he values the church when he laid down his life for the sheep. He obtained them, he purchased them, he redeemed them through his death and resurrection. He declared to us his, he declared us his own. He made us his beloved bride through his sacrifice. And this is the church over which the Holy Spirit has authority. Who has authority to appoint overseers? The owner and only the owner. The Spirit equal with the Father and Son oversees the overseers. He speaks through the preachers. He loves through the elders in the congregation. I love this church dearly, but I'm very mindful of the fact that it does not belong to me. I often say my church, I just mean the church I go to. I don't mean I own it. We love this church, but it's not ours. It belongs to the triune God. We are simply stewards of his belonging. This is the hope for discouraged pastors and members. <clears throat> because when we can't bear to invite one more family over, and we don't feel like we have the strength to answer that text. And we just want to come in and sit down and not talk to anyone just once and then go home. 
The Spirit reminds us what the Godhead has done to gain possession of the church and calls us to greater love and obedience. He obtained us with his blood. Richard Baxter again so powerfully says this, Can you not hear Christ saying, Did I die for these people and you refuse to look after them? Were they worth my blood and they're not worth your labor? Did I come down from heaven to seek and to save that which was lost and you will not go next door or to the next street or to the next village? How small is your labor and condescension compared to mine? Jesus says, I debased myself to do this. It is your honor to serve one another. Have I done and suffered so much for their salvation and will you refuse what little lies upon your hands? Friends, the church belongs to the triune God. Will we cast off the Father's beloved church as something optional? Will we prioritize sports or work or even our own family over the church which Christ has bled for? Will we claim we've done enough when the Spirit stands ready to equip us for more? We must always view the church with a servant's heart as we serve the true owners of the church. This will drive us to obedience. This is our motivation to hold elders accountable. I've, I've mentioned this, um, the idea of holding me accountable, and I've had some of you like, oh, that's weird, I don't like that. I get that. I'm not a big fan either. <laughs> but it doesn't matter, because this is God's church. He gets to tell us how it's designed. Hold our elders accountable, not because we want a pastor who loves us well, but because we care for the church of God. Don't do it for yourself. Do it for the person next to you. Do it for your other members. Do it that they may have a shepherd who is faithful and loves well. And this, again, that's how we select other elders, men who will serve as servants of the true owner of the church, not trying to gather power to themselves. This is our motivation as members. We examine our hearts because we long to walk in the holiness to which God has called us. We love our church equally and without separation because Christ died for the whole church equally. He didn't pay extra for the people you like. He didn't pay less. We submit to the word and to our elders' supervision because the Spirit is the one who made and designed the church. We respond to and seek our shepherd's care because that is one way the love of the Father flows to us through his church. And we serve one another with humble hearts because most ultimately we are serving the triune God when we serve one another. These two aspects, I believe, are the most central and most important part of the shepherd's work to guard the flock. He must always be pointing to Christ or others will draw the sheep away. He must always be providing care or the sheep will be hurt and lost. But the shepherd's job is not only preventative defense, There will still come times of attack, no matter how good our defenses are. And in those moments, the shepherds must protect the church. Look at verses 29 and 31, 231. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. Friends, the shepherds must strive to protect the flock from predators, from wolves, fierce and destructive people who will by no means spare the flock. They are here to destroy the flock. And friends, when they enter the church, they're not going to have a big 666 tattoo, twirling an evil mustache. We won't know them often. Jesus warned us about these wolves. He said that they will come in in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. They look like us. So how can we identify them? Jesus says, by their fruits, by their works. They take advantage of the single women in the church. They are always asking for financial gifts and for help. They are not there to help others or to praise the Lord. They're there to devour and feed themselves and get praise and following and money for themselves. Friends, this is wickedness and shepherds must fight off the wolves. Calvin said shepherds have two voices, one 
to lovingly lead the sheep and one to scare off the wolves. There are different ways to shepherd sheep and wolves. How do our shepherds protect us from the fierce wolves? Well, just a few top level basic things. We take membership very seriously because there may be a wolf attending in sheep's clothing, but there's a big difference between attending and being a member. We take membership very seriously. We guard the door to fellowship and unity in the church. Second, we're very careful with our money. Our church does not give immediate financial assistance to someone outside our church for any reason. I get a lot of phone calls every month asking us to violate that rule, but we don't because we're protecting the church. We don't want to be devoured by wolves. Third, we're even more careful with our little ones. Even just being a member, as high of a bar as that is, is not enough to serve with our children. There are background checks and references and paperwork and all kinds of things that we require before anyone gets near our kids. We want to guard against wolves. And fourth and most continually, shepherds strive to know and love and care for the sheep. Because look, if, if you have a sheep and a wolf in sheep's clothing, from a distance, you can't tell the difference. You have to get close. You have to examine. You have to know their works and their fruit and their life. Paul says the wolves will come in among you. They'll try to blend in. They'll hide from the shepherds. It's really hard to do in a small church like this. It's hard to hide. But friends, this requires shepherds to know the sheep deeply and personally, to know your struggles, not because we think you're a wolf, but because we are called to guard all the sheep. That means we have to know you, know your struggles and victories, your strengths and weaknesses. And this goes back to the importance of preparation as defense. The pastor must provide shepherding care to the sheep because then he'll know them. He'll know their works. He'll be prepared to fight back if he discovers a wolf in the flock. But the shepherds of the church must not only protect from outside wolves, they must also protect the church from inside sources of perversion. From perversion. Paul says in verse 30 that from among the church, even from among those elders who are standing there in Miletus that day, men will arise speaking twisted things. Unlike the true shepherds who are made so by the Spirit, these men will raise themselves up and will speak twisted things, false doctrines, other gospels, anything that goes against Scripture. And notice these men don't proclaim or testify or teach publicly like Paul does. They just speak quietly, off on the side, whispering to others, leading people away. That's their goal, to draw away the disciples to themselves, away from Christ, away from the church. Paul would later write to Timothy, who had come to serve as a shepherd in the Ephesian church, about these men. We see in his letters that Paul's words came true. Two of the elders, Hymenaeus and Alexander, had swerved from the faith. They lived for the love of money and took advantage of others. They taught people to reject Paul's doctrine and to listen to them instead. They focused on arguing about words and genealogies and their own opinions and anything but Scripture itself and its clear meaning. And they required abstinence from marriage and foods and other good things that God had made as this higher form of holiness that was truly just legalism. Friends, does that sound familiar? It should because that's most pastors in the United States. And it's everyone on CBN, at least most everyone. Our world loves these kind of shepherds because those who hate the church, they're a great example of why they hate the church. And those who don't know the truth are being led by wolves. This goes back to our point about preparation as defense. The best way to fight against false teachers is to spend your life pointing to Christ. Think about the first time you left your kids home alone. Did you take them by the hand and show them, don't touch this, don't touch this, don't put a plug in that socket? No, obviously not, because whatever you tell them to do, that's the thing they're going to do as soon as you walk out of the room. You don't spend all your time telling them what not to do. You give them basic guidelines and you tell them what they should do. In the same way, our best defense against false teachers is not to have an encyclopedic knowledge of every false thing that someone may say or do. It's to be continually pointed to Christ, to Christ as our hope and our authority. But what do we do if wolves do come in? 
What should we do if one of our own elders turns out to be a wicked man speaking twisted things? Paul wrote about this in 1 Timothy. Again, to the Ephesian church, their two elders had walked away from the faith and a good conscience, so Paul said their punishment was to be handed over to Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. If one day we discover a wolf among the sheep who is devouring the sheep as a predator, if one day one of our elders is found to be twisted and perverted, it is our responsibility not to deal with this quietly, but to publicly put them out in disgrace for a number of reasons. One, to protect the church, to get them out of the church. You don't just leave the wolf among the sheep, hope he gets better. So you protect the church, you protect the gospel and its testimony around the world. But also for the sake of the wolf. They're not going to learn not to blaspheme if we don't kick them out. And friends, I wish churches took this responsibility seriously. We have seen in the last two decades the horrible abuse that has been brought because people have not obeyed this command. How many young people would have been saved from abuse if churches had publicly condemned these wolves rather than covering it up and sending them somewhere else? How much shame would have been avoided for Christ's kingdom if these perverted men had been publicly condemned and removed from the church? How many church splits and conflicts would have been peacefully resolved if the church had banded together and handed those speaking twisted things over to Satan? Not because we hate them, because we love Christ most, and we love the flock, and because we love them, we turn them over to Satan to learn. Friends, that's, that's why we practice church discipline, and why for elders there's an even higher standard. For those in positions of authority, they are removed quickly and publicly, that the gospel may be kept clear. This is not something that can be put off. It's not a can that be kick, can be kicked down the road. We've seen the destruction that that brings. And yet Paul still warns us, he knows we will struggle with being passive. Verse 31, therefore be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. Wolves are coming from outside to devour the church. Wicked men are coming to twist what's true from inside the church. We must be alert. We must be awake. We must keep watch. We must never stop warning one another. We must do it night and day, and we must remember the faithful example of Paul and Jesus, our good shepherd, who spoke against false teachers. Friends, certainly the elders must do this, but all of us must do this. We must protect one another. If your friend in the church says, oh man, I was listening to this teacher, and you know they're false, don't let that go. Love them enough to talk to them about it. Warn them about the wolves but if we're not careful, this focus on guarding the sheep can become our consuming identity. We can become defensive or separate ourselves from everything. We become so focused on guarding that we forget about love. And sadly, this is what happened in the Ephesian church. And so shepherds must guard the flock from the loss of passion. Paul admonished them with tears. He didn't do it dryly. He didn't care. It wasn't a lack of care. He wept over them. He loved them. He cared for them. This was not a task. This was guarding those he loved. And from the letters in Timothy, we know these false teachers arose. And from Jesus' letter in, in Revelation 2 to the church of Ephesus, we know that the Ephesian church won their fight against the false teachers. Praise the Lord. I'm thankful for that. But in the fight, they lost their love. Let's, as we close, go to Revelation 2. There, Jesus says, I know your works. This is to the Ephesian church, the same group. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, found them to be false. Man, you, they did good work. They tested people. They proved people false. Praise the Lord for their faithfulness. But, verse 4, I have this against you, Jesus says. You have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent to the one who conquers. I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Friends, they became focused on winning. They became focused on being right. And as a result, they lost the love for Christ and for one another that was supposed to define the church, not accuracy, but love. 
So as we strive to guard the church in our own hearts from false teaching, we must remember how Jesus defines victory, what makes us conquerors. It's not defeating false teachers. The one who conquers is the one who holds fast to love. Those who, God, those who love God are the ones who will eat of the tree of life. Those who love one another are those who will enter paradise. Not those who are right, but those who love. Friends, the enemy's planes are on our radar. God has warned us they are coming. So may the Spirit work through our shepherds and through each one of us to guard the flock from attack and even more so to be guarded from losing our love. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful that you have given us shepherds to guard the flock. We buck against authority. We want to be individuals making our own way, but God, that's not how you've designed us. You've designed us to need the church, to need protectors. God, I pray, help us submit, help us love, help us listen, help us obey, that you may be glorified in us, that your church may be protected from wolves and twisted things. And God, for myself as a shepherd, that I may guard the flock in love with tears. That we may present this church to you spotless, holy, and protected when you return. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We must never lose our love for Jesus and his gospel. That is what will best guard the church, but what is our hope to never lose our love? It's that Jesus will never stop loving us. So let's stand and let's sing, He will hold me fast, knowing that that is our hope.